4.1. 1. I would have been terrified. 2. If I told you what happened. 3. If I hadn't read the safety information. 4. I wouldn't fly with that airline. 5. If I'd stayed in the building longer. 6. I'd travel more. 4.2. 1. I would have been terrified if I'd been in that situation. 2. If I told you what happened, you wouldn't believe me. 3. If I hadn't read the safety information, I wouldn't have acted so quickly. 4. I wouldn't fly with that airline if I were you. 5. If I'd stayed in the building longer, I would have died. 6. I'd travel more if my husband wasn't afraid of flying. 4.3 Yossi and Kevin soon realised that going by river was a big mistake. The river got faster and faster, and soon they were in rapids. The raft was swept down the river at an incredible speed, until it hit a rock. Kevin managed to swim to land, but Yossi was swept away by the rapids. Yossi! Help! Help! Kev! Yossi! But Yossi didn't drown. He came up to the surface several kilometers downriver. By an incredible piece of luck, he found their backpack floating in the river. The backpack contained a little food, insect repellent, a lighter, and most important of all, the map. The two friends were now separated by a canyon and six or seven kilometers of jungle. 4.4. Kevin was feeling desperate. He didn't know if Yossi was alive or dead, but he started walking down river to look for him. He felt responsible for what had happened to his friend. Yossi! Yossi! Yossi, however, was feeling very optimistic. He was sure that Kevin would look for him, so he started walking up river calling his friend's name. Kevin! 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 But nobody answered. At night, Yossi tried to sleep, but he felt terrified. The jungle was full of noises. Suddenly he woke up because he heard a branch breaking. He turned on his flashlight. There was a jaguar staring at him. Yossi was trembling with fear, but then he remembered something that he once saw in a film. He used the cigarette lighter to set fire to the insect repellent spray and he managed to scare the jaguar away. Four point five. After five days alone, Yossi was exhausted and starving. Suddenly, as he was walking, he saw a footprint on the trail. It was a hiking boot. It had to be Kevin's footprint. He followed the trail until he discovered another footprint. But then he realised to his horror that it was the same footprint and that it wasn't Kevin's. It was his own. He had been walking around in a circle. Suddenly Yossi realised that he would never find Kevin. He felt sure that Kevin must be dead. Yossi felt depressed and on the point of giving up. Four point six. 
But Kevin wasn't dead. He was still looking for Yossi. But after nearly a week, he was weak and exhausted from lack of food and lack of sleep. He decided that it was time to forget Yossi and try to save himself. He had just enough strength left to hold onto a log and let himself float down the river. Kevin was incredibly lucky. He was rescued by two Bolivian hunters in a canoe. The men only hunted in that part of the rainforest once a year, so if they had been there a short time earlier or later, they would never have seen Kevin. They took him back to the town of San Jose and he spent two days recovering. 4.7 As soon as Kevin felt well enough, he went to a Bolivian army base and asked them to look for Yossi. Mi amigo esta My friend is lost in the jungle. Selva. Deben buscarle. You must look for him. The army was sure that Yossi must be dead, but in the end, Kevin persuaded them to take him up in a plane and fly over the part of the rainforest where Yossi could be. It was a hopeless search. The plane had to fly too high, and the forest was too dense. They couldn't see anything at all. Kevin felt terribly guilty. He was convinced that it was all his fault that Yossi was going to die in the jungle. Kevin's last hope was to pay a local man with a boat to take him up the river to look for his friend. Four point eight. By now, Yossi had been on his own in the jungle for nearly three weeks. He hadn't eaten for days. He was starving, exhausted, and slowly losing his mind. It was evening. He lay down by the side of the river, ready for another night alone in the jungle. Suddenly, he heard the sound of a bee buzzing in his ear. He thought a bee had got inside his mosquito net. When he opened his eyes, he saw that the buzzing noise wasn't a bee. It was a boat. Yossi was too weak to shout, but Kevin had already seen him. Yossi! 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 It was a one in a million chance, but Yossi was saved. When Yossi had recovered, he and Kevin flew to the city of La Paz, and they went directly to the hotel where they had agreed to meet Marcus and Carl. But Marcus and Carl were not there. The two men had never arrived back in the town of Apollo. The Bolivian army organized a search of the rainforest, but Marcus and Carl were never seen again. Four point nine Song I Will Survive. At first, I was afraid, I was petrified. Kept thinking I could never live without you by my side. But then I spent so many nights thinking how you did me wrong. Now I grew strong, and I learned how to get along.
4.10. Conversation 1. Have you seen my car keys? I can't find them. No, I haven't. I don't believe... They've disappeared. When did you have them last? When I came in last night. I'm sure I left them on the table in the hall, but they're not there now. You may have left them in your jacket pocket. Have you looked? I can't have left them there. I wasn't wearing a jacket. You must have moved them. I haven't touched them. What's the first thing you did when you came in last night? Uh, I turned the television on to watch the news. They must be in the living room, then. Have a look. <sighs> have you found them? Yes. They were on the top of the TV. <laughs> but I definitely didn't leave them there. Someone must have moved them. You're so lucky you don't have to work on Saturdays. 4.11 Conversation 2. So where are we now? Well, I think we must be in Park Street. Look, what does that sign say? Um, Merton Avenue. Oh, no, we must have taken the wrong turning again. We should have turned left at the last traffic lights. Left? You said right. OK, I might have said right. It's difficult to read the map in the dark. Anyway, I thought you'd been to this club before and knew where you were going. Conversation 3. So, what do you think? Mmm. Nice. Only nice? It's a bit, um, sweet. Sweet? It's supposed to be sweet. It's sweet and sour pork. Yeah, but I think you should have used less sugar. <sighs> I used exactly what the recipe said. Well, you can't have read it properly. It's definitely too sweet. OK, next time we'll get a takeaway from the Chinese restaurant. Oh, don't be so sensitive. I'm only making a constructive criticism. 4.12. 1. You may have left them in your jacket pocket. 2. I can't have left them there. I wasn't wearing a jacket. 3. Someone must have moved them. Four. We must have taken the wrong turning again. Five. We should have turned left at the last traffic lights. Six. OK, I might have said right. Seven. Yes, but I think you should have used less sugar. Eight. You can't have read it properly. 4.13. 1. You shouldn't have told her. 2. He might have got lost. 3. She can't have forgotten. 4. You must have felt stupid. 5. He may have made a mistake. 6. You should have known the answer. 4.14 In life, we sometimes have disagreements with people. It could be with your partner, with your boss, with your parents, or with a friend. When this happens, the important thing is to try not to let a calm discussion turn into a heated argument. But of course, this is easier said than done. The first thing I would say is that the way you begin the conversation is very important. Imagine you are a student and you share a flat with another student who you think isn't doing her share of the housework. If you say, look, you never do your share of the housework, what are we going to do about it? The discussion will very soon turn into an argument. It's much more constructive to say something like, I think we'd better have another look about how we divide up the housework. Maybe there's a better way of doing it. My second piece of advice is simple. If you are the person who is in the wrong, just admit it. This is the easiest and best way to avoid an argument. Just apologize to your flatmate, your parents, or your husband and move on. The other person will have much more respect for you in the future if you do that. The next tip is don't exaggerate. Try not to say things like, you always come home late when my mother comes to dinner, when perhaps this has only happened twice, or you never remember to buy the toothpaste. 
This will just make the other person think you're being unreasonable and will probably make him or her stop listening to your arguments. Sometimes we just can't avoid a discussion turning into an argument. But if you do start arguing with someone, it is important to keep things under control, and there are ways to do this. The most important thing is don't raise your voice. Raising your voice will just make the other person lose their temper too. If you find yourself raising your voice, stop for a moment and take a deep breath. Say, I'm sorry I shouted, but this is very important to me, and continue calmly. If you can talk calmly and quietly, you'll find your partner will be more ready to think about what you are saying. It is also very important to stick to the point. Try to keep to the topic you are talking about. Don't bring up old arguments or try to bring in other issues. Just concentrate on solving the one problem you are having and leave the other things for another time. So, for example, if you're arguing about the housework, don't start talking about mobile phone bills as well. And my final tip is that if necessary, call time out like in a sports match. If you think that an argument is getting out of control, then you can say to the other person, listen, I'd rather talk about this tomorrow when we've both calmed down. You can then continue the discussion the next day when perhaps both of you are feeling less tense and angry. That way, there is much more chance that you will be able to reach an agreement. You'll also probably find that the problem is much easier to solve when you've both had a good night's sleep. Well, those are my tips. But I want to say one last important thing. Some people think that arguing is always bad. This is not true. Conflict is a normal part of life, and dealing with conflict is an important part of any relationship, whether it's three people sharing a flat, a married couple, or just two good friends. If you don't learn to argue properly, then when a real problem comes along, you won't be prepared to face it together. Think of the smaller arguments as training sessions. Learn how to argue cleanly and fairly. It will help your relationship become stronger and last longer. 4.15 1. But of course this is easier said than done. 2. If you're the person who is in the wrong, just admit it. 3. It is important to keep things under control. 4. Raising your voice will just make the other person lose their temper too. 5. Stop for a moment and take a deep breath. 6. It is also very important to stick to the point. 7. There is much more chance that you will be able to reach an agreement. 8. Dealing with conflict is an important part of any relationship. 4.16 1. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Four 
To tonight's edition of Use Your Senses. First, with us we have Joanna and Steve from Stepney. <laughs> now, the blindfold's on. You can't see anything, can you? No. No, nothing at all. Right, so first, the mystery drink. Remember, you can smell it, but you can't taste it. Starting now. It doesn't really smell of anything. Mm -hmm. It smells fruity to me. Not very strong, but definitely fruity. <laughs> yeah, it smells a bit like orange juice, but sweeter. Uh -huh. mm. It could be <laughs> then. OK, so now the food. This you can taste, but you can't see, of course. Ready? Mm. Now. Mm. Um, well, it's meat, isn't it? Mm. Mm. It tastes a bit like chicken, but I don't think it is chicken. <laughs> I don't think I've had it before. Mm -hmm. The texture isn't quite like chicken. Mm. It tastes quite light. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's duck. You've got ten more seconds. Ooh. Um, it must be... Absolutely. OK. Now, the objects. Uh, it feels like a coin. Can I feel it? Yes. <laughs> it definitely feels metallic, mm -hmm. but it's completely smooth. Ah. It doesn't seem to have any markings. Oh, it's got two tiny little holes in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's a... Oh. That's it? So, now we're going to take off the blindfolds. There we are. Oh, thanks, that's better. Thanks. <laughs> and now to the sound effect. I'm going to play you a sound and you've got to decide what it is you're hearing. Remember, you can hear it twice only. Ready? Uh -huh. Now. Oh, it sounds like thunder to me. Well, maybe, but it sounds very distant. Could it be a train? No, I think it's something natural. Mm -hmm. You know, not a machine. Can we hear it again, please? <laughs> of course. Yes, I think it's... What do you think? Could be. I'll go with that. Right. Time's up, so now the moment of truth. Oh. Did Steve and Joanna get it right? Mm. Remember, you need all the answers right to win today's prize. Mm. Our oh. assistant, Vanessa, will give us the answers. A round of applause for Vanessa. <laughs> Four point eighteen. Well, we'll start with the sound effect. And Steve and Joanna said they thought it was horses galloping. And that was right. <laughs> Our mystery object today, well, Steve and Joanna said a button. And that was the right answer. So congratulations again. <laughs> the mystery drink. What did they think it was? Pineapple juice! <laughs> yes, it was pineapple juice. <laughs> and finally, the mystery food. Stephen and Joanna said turkey. So, was it turkey? No, it was oh. rabbit. Oh. oh, so I'm afraid it's goodbye to Steve and Joanna. Give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Four point nineteen. Shake your head. Fold your arms. Raise your eyebrows. Scratch your head. 
Clap your hands. Comb your hair. Bite your nails. Shake hands with the person next to you. Nod your head. Touch your chin. Snap your fingers. Wink. Stare at the person next to you. Point at the board. Stretch your arms. Shrug your shoulders. Wave goodbye. 4.20 Calf Wrist Palms Wrinkles Comb Kneel Thumb 4.21 Asthma Castle Cupboard Sign Doubt Half. Honest. Island. Knock. Psychologist. Receipt. Whole. 4.22. 1. I doubt if you'll have wrinkles before you're 40. 2. The psychologist told me to sign my name. 3. He broke his wrist and thumb. 4. I honestly believe the whole thing is wrong. 5. Would you like a receipt? 6. Let's climb to the castle on the island. 4.23, part 1. Trevor White is a Canadian actor. Can you tell us a bit about the kind of acting you do? Uh, there, there isn't much I, I don't do, I guess, um, as far as acting goes. Um, there's theatre, obviously, um, film work, uh, television work, sometimes commercials, uh, and even voiceover work, where, which is uh, for radio or for television, or even sometimes animated shows where you lend your voice to those as well. So I, I've rarely said no to an acting job. Did you always want to be an actor? Well, it's something that I always love to do, act, uh, as a kid in, in high school and school plays and uh, uh, in, in my spare time just playing around with friends, you know, acting and, and improvising and, and that kind of thing. But I don't think I ever believed that I could or, or ever took it seriously to, to act as a profession um, or for the rest of my life. So uh, I went into university and took economics as a more practical thing to do. Um, but I, I didn't really enjoy it, I guess, and, and, uh, and ultimately, um, after university, I, uh, I started taking some acting classes and uh, really enjoyed that, and um, then started doing student films and uh, fringe theater and unpaid work just to get experience in, in acting, and uh, loved it, and then started doing it more seriously and got an agent and started getting proper acting jobs, and, uh, and that was uh, about 13 years ago. What's the most difficult thing about preparing for a new role? Um, it really depends. When, when you do a play, for example, you have three, four, sometimes even six weeks to rehearse uh, with the other people and the director and the props and everything. So you have a long time to learn your lines, to, to as it were, find the character. The memorization is, is the most like real work <laughs> that can be difficult you know just memorizing lots of lines but uh, and in film and television you don't have the benefit of rehearsal you just show up and you're expected to know all your lines and then you do it a few times and that's it uh, so you you have to be very disciplined and get all that ready in advance how do you learn your lines um, I have a, uh, a dictaphone actually <laughs> um, which I just record the other people's lines um, obviously in my voice, I don't do strange character voices because that would be weird. 
Uh, and, um, you know, I just say their line, I stop it, I say my line, I play the next line. So you just basically record all the other lines in any given scene and, uh, and play it back and, and just work through it slowly. Um, it's amazing the difference it makes when, you, when the writing is good and it makes sense. Uh, it's much easier to memorize. But if sometimes you, you audition for a, a bad science fiction TV show or a, or a horror movie or something, you often have a much harder time memorizing poorly written lines because they, well, they're just bad. But of course it's your job, so you do it. 4.24, part two. Is there any role you've particularly enjoyed? Um, there's, there's a few roles that I've played or, or oftentimes when you do something, it's, it's the whole experience of a job, not necessarily just the part you have in it. Uh, earlier this year, I got to work for the Royal Shakespeare Company for the first time, and we did uh, Coriolanus, one of Shakespeare's lesser performed plays uh, in Stratford in Washington, in America, uh, also in Newcastle here in the United Kingdom and in Madrid in Spain for five months, uh, which was amazing. What's the most difficult role that you've ever had to play? Well, I suppose this last role that I played is, is one of the most difficult parts, uh, Tolisophidius and Coriolanus, because there were lots of things that were very demanding about the part. We had to do a, a huge uh, sword and axe fight in the middle of the play, um, which I'd done stage combat before, but never anything like this. We were using actual, I mean, they were blunt swords and axes, but they were still very large pieces of metal. And we had a couple of small accidents, but no, no major ones, luckily. Um, I gave the other guy three stitches on his fingers at one point when, when he parried in the wrong place. That's my opinion, anyway. Do you prefer working in the theatre or in film and TV? I think theatre is the most satisfying work in acting oftentimes because you get to do it over and over again in front of a live audience, but it doesn't tend to pay as well as film and television, which is also fun but not as glamorous as people might think it is, I guess. So being an actor isn't really glamorous? No, I don't think acting is a glamorous life, um, particularly in, well, I guess in any way. In theatre, it's you know, you don't really earn that much money um, and you, you know, you work hard. Um, yeah, uh, and, and film and television work is, uh, you know, it can be a lot of fun. You can get to work with some famous people sometimes or some very talented people that you admire and that's a, that's a thrilling thing. And yeah, you can, sh you get to shoot guns or, you know, go on car chases and all those things are really fun. But uh, most of the time, the 90% of, of the day, even when you're doing exciting things, you're just sitting and waiting around. You're always waiting around. They're always fixing lights, setting up new camera positions, trying to figure out who's going where, when. And it, it's a, you know, it takes them s f to film a proper, you know, feature film takes months and maybe in all that time, only two or three of those days all, all told is actually you doing anything. So, um, yeah, people, I think a lot of people get into extra work and stuff because they think, oh, this will be really glamorous, but you end up sort of reading a book about nine hours a day. Um, so, yeah, and I've never been on a red carpet, so I, I suppose I can't judge. That looks glamorous. 4.25 one. There isn't much I, I don't do, I guess, um, as far as acting goes. Two. You just show up and you're expected to know all your lines. Three. You do it a few times and that's it. Four. It's amazing the difference it makes when, you, when the writing is good. Five. I gave the other guy three stitches on his fingers at one point when, when he parried in the wrong place. Six. You get to do it over and over again. 4.26. One. Ben. Have you ever acted? I was in a music video once, and that's about as far as I've gone. But I mean, I'm a musician, so I kind of appear on stage quite a lot. How does it make you feel? Um, I suppose... Nervous at first, but then you settle in within a couple of minutes and 
before you know it, you kind of lose any awareness of kind of any external factors or anything like that. You're not aware of anything else outside of this kind of bubble that you've kind of managed to transport yourself into. Two, Louise. Have you ever acted? Yes, uh, I was in the Royal Shakespeare Company up in my area and uh, did a few plays and a few musicals. Um, and I'm a, <clears throat> a specialist makeup artist, so I kind of work with actors doing all their makeup and zombies and that. What do you like about it? The buzz of it. Being able to be someone else in front of people and just being someone else is good. <laughs> Three, Mike. Have you ever acted? Yes, I have. I'm studying act acting now. I'm a student studying theatre and music. Uh, I've been in a few things when I was um, little, and um, I was I've been in a few shows around London and things like that. But I I plan to go further. <laughs> How does it make you feel? I love it. I think it's really great because you don't you get you get to you don't have to be yourself for once you're on stage and you can just be whoever you, your character is meant to be and you can just sort of get taken away into the world and you can get really into it that's what i really like about acting four cherry have you ever acted uh yeah i i'm in like a drama youth group so a couple of plays i've been in like bugsy malone and the wizard of oz a modernized one and stuff so yeah <laughs> How does it make you feel? Uh, yeah, I do, I, it is nerve-wracking when just as you're about to go on, but apart from that, yeah, once you're on, you're, it's fine. Five, Ray. Have you ever acted? Possibly not since I was at school. Uh, no, I don't think, not since I was at school, no. How did it make you feel? Mm, very nervous beforehand, very apprehensive beforehand, and then quite excited when it all went well, yes. 4.27. One. I was in a music video once, and that's about as far as I've gone. Two. The buzz of it, being able to be someone else in front of people. Three. You can just sort of get taken away into this other world. Four. A couple of plays I've been in. Five. It is nerve-wracking when just as you're about to go on. 4.28. One. There are some common sense precautions you can take if you want to avoid a snake bite when you're hiking in an area where you know there might be snakes. First, when choosing your campsite, make sure you pitch your tent in a clearing, well away from long grass, trees or large rocks. Secondly, be very careful where you're treading, especially if there are fallen trees. Snakes like to hide behind these. This is the advice I would highlight most. Finally, and this is common sense. Make sure you're wearing proper shoes, hiking or walking shoes. And, of course, never ever wear sandals or go barefoot. Two. Good morning and welcome on board this Air Britannia flight AB443 to Tunisia. My name is Steve Morris and I am your pilot today. First of all, I'd like to apologise for the 40-minute delay in boarding. This was due to the late arrival of the incoming flight. In a few minutes, the cabin crew will be giving you instructions about what to do in case of an emergency. I would like to stress how important it is, even for frequent flyers, to pay attention to the safety demonstration. Every aircraft is different and emergency exits are located in different places. I would also like to recommend that you read the safety instructions card, which you'll find in your seat pocket. Flying time today will be approximately 2 hours and 45 minutes and we'll be taking off in a southeasterly direction and flying over Brighton before we cross the channel and head into France. Three. What time is it? It's 8.15. John should have been here by now. Are you sure you told him the dinner was tonight? Of course I'm sure. I invited him when I saw him last Saturday. So why isn't he here then? Is he usually late for things? No, but he's a bit absent-minded. It's my fault. I should have reminded him today. I know what he's like. I'll give him a call on his mobile. But if he's driving, he probably won't answer it. Something might have happened to him on the way. It's snowing very heavily now. Relax. You don't know John as well as I do. Chances are it went right out of his mind. I think we ought to have dinner and not wait. Everyone must be starving. Four. 
OK, so you're getting the black dress, right? Oh, I just can't make my mind up. I mean, I know it's nice and it's not that expensive, but I still think maybe the one I tried on in the last place was nicer. I mean, it, it suited me better. What do you think? I think they both looked great. Was the other one more expensive? Oh, I can't remember. You know, I think I need to just try it on again before I decide. What? Go back to the other shop now? But we've already spent an hour there. And that means finding somewhere to park there again. If you really liked it, you should have bought it then. Couldn't you go back on your own tomorrow? No! I really want to go back now. If I wait till tomorrow, it might be gone. Yes, I definitely need to try it on again. Come on. Oh, please. Five. What do you think of it? I love it. I think the expressions on their faces are incredible. Mm. Look at the way the child is looking at him, as if he had the most beautiful face in the world. The old man is ugly, but she can see right past his ugliness. Actually, it's a boy. Mm. The child, I mean, not a girl. The title is Old Man with a Young Boy. It's just with those wonderful golden curls, he looks like a girl. I agree with you, though. It's an amazing painting. I guess the child must be the man's grandson. What do you think would have happened to the old man's nose? It looks as if he had some sort of illness, I suppose. Maybe it was the plague or something. Mm. There was a lot of it around at the time. 4.29 And on today's holiday programme we have Caroline and Ben to tell us about their experiences backpacking in their gap year. Caroline, if I can start with you. You spent three months in South America, is that right? Yes. I started in Argentina and then went to Chile, Peru, Bolivia and Ecuador. I stuck to Spanish-speaking countries because my Spanish is good, but my Portuguese is non-existent, so that's why I didn't go to Brazil. <laughs> Did you go on your own? No. I met up with some friends when I got there. Uh, they'd been working in Buenos Aires and then we travelled together. I don't think I'd have felt completely safe travelling on my own. <laughs> How about you, Ben? Yeah, I went on my own round Central and Eastern Europe. Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, Hungary, Slovenia, Croatia. Oh, and Serbia. <laughs> Could you speak any of the languages? No, but it wasn't a problem because everywhere I went I found people spoke really good English especially the young people I met. I was amazed. Some of them actually sounded like native speakers. And did you ever feel unsafe or lonely travelling on your own? Well, I mean, I was safety conscious, obviously, but it was more making sure I never lost anything, like my phone or my passport or credit card. I'm usually not very good at that. But otherwise, no. It was great just being by myself because I could decide how long I wanted to stay anywhere and where I wanted to go next. I mean, I had vaguely planned my route, but I was free to change my mind whenever I liked. Yes, that is definitely an advantage, because sometimes one of us wanted to leave a place earlier or didn't like the hotel and wanted to move, and there were a few arguments. Not major ones, but, you know, arguments. So what kind of places did you both stay in? I stayed mostly in youth hostels. I'd thought of camping before I left, but I decided the weather would probably be too cold. It was March and April. The hostels were pretty basic, but great places to meet people. We stayed mainly either in budget hotels or sometimes in bed and breakfasts. They were all places we'd found on the internet, and generally speaking, they were good. In fact, we were often pleasantly surprised by how comfortable and 